Hello, and a very warm welcome to this eCancer Educational Centre, which is coming from sunny San Francisco at GUASCO. My name's Heather Payne, I'm an oncologist from London, England, and I'm joined by a very esteemed panel to discuss tonight hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. So my panel is um, Dr. Neil Shaw, who is resident here in the US. The rest of us have had to travel. D Dr. Eleni Stathieu, who is from both Houston and Greece. Which one did you come from today? Houston. Oh, Still right. So that was, that was easy. So you were a resident as well. And then Professor Nicola Motte, who is from France. So it gives us great pleasure this evening to talk about hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. And I think we've all debated castrate-resistant prostate cancer for many, many years. And this is still a relatively new topic. And the last two, three years, we've seen data giving an overall survival when docetaxel was added to ADT for hormone-sensitive disease from the charted study in Stampede. And then last year, we saw that abiraterone can also improve overall survival when added to ADT in both the latitude and, again, the stampede studies. So, Neil, how has this changed your practice? I mean, it's been amazing data. We, th we thought we'd got hormone-sensitive SUS, didn't we, really, that we just gave ADT. How has this changed your daily practice? So I think you, make, you raise a great point. I mean, it's only in the last couple of years, really, that we've had all the CRPC-approved therapies, and then now on the heels of that, a way to be less nihilistic about patients presenting newly diagnosed with metastatic disease, and where we would only historically just give ADT. So the charted and the stampede data, I think, has been exceptional in telling us we can combine ADT with either docetaxel or ADT with abiraterone. Interestingly, today, the FDA in the U.S. just gave full approval uh, for AD the latitude data, essentially. So That's fantastic. It, it, it's really changed it tremendously. I think for urologists, medical oncologists, in a multidisciplinary way, I think it's absolutely essential that a patient who presents now newly diagnosed with metastatic disease has that really robust physician-patient shared discussion. And of course, we'll talk about, I think, today, do you start with the abiraterone or docetaxel? How would you sequence? And I'm sure we're going to discuss also the, the nuances between high and low volume and, and how do you, you know, radiologically image for that. Thank you. I mean, Eleni, do you think it's a good cutoff, high and low volume disease? No. Obviously, you've heard me before complain about these simplistic approaches to life, which is something that urologists are not to blame for. I think we appreciate these simple cutoffs. It was designed by the medical oncologist. I do. I, I just said so. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, we have to rely, though, on some form of discrimination of our patients until we have more robust biomarker-driven data in a similar fashion like breast cancer does, mm -hmm. right? That would be the goal. And with that in mind, I think we all agreed recently also in meetings that the word hormone naive or hormone sensitive, what have you, is going to go away and we're probably reverting to the older, older terminology of advanced prostate cancer mm. rather than anything else. But till the time, as you were pointing out, when we do have such biomarkers, what are we going to do? High volume, low volume is an option. Another option is to rely on features of the disease, such as presence mm -hmm. of visceral metastases, liver metastases would be a subset, small one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes looking specifically whether there are markers within the tumors that we are familiar with, new mm -hmm. endocrine markers maybe. So I employ in my practice all of these surrogate supportive markers that are not proven, and they come mainly from post hoc analysis to decide which of the two. I would not, at this point, that we have both the data from docetax and abirato, say that if I have a patient with more than five meds, with one of them at least being outside the exhaled skeleton, I would go for docetaxel. Mm -hmm. More than likely, I would go for abirato because the latter trial was all inclusive as a risk. This was a mm -hmm. high risk trial. Mm -hmm. So it included a lot of such patients which are arguably the common type of patient you see in your clinic. Mm. 
So I don't know, Nicola? Agree and partly disagree, oh, as usual. Uh, again, <clears throat> uh, we have to realize this is based on trials. The subcategory, a high volume and a low volume, is a subgroup category that was completely artificial, defined by Chartid. And the trial Chartid as a whole is positive. Stampede, no stratification, positive again. So is really the volume as defined by Chartid relevant? Completely agree with you, not at all. But if you consider again for Abbey, latitude, there was stratification based on Gleason, number of Mets, etc. Again, stampede, no stratification at all. Okay. And again, positive. So it's, it's probably completely irrelevant to, to stratify by disease volume. And second, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Visual meds, we all agree, that's poor prognostic, no question. But I, I remember that when the trial of the charter was presented, the discussion showed very nicely a slide with bone mats or the axial skeleton. That was low volume by definition. And in the opposite, four mats, one mat in the ribs, by definition is high volume. Is it really that relevant? I'm not definitely convinced on that. And you, we must also remember, and that's a very important word of caution, all this is based on bone scan and CT scan, very old fashioned imaging. Nowadays, we're jumping to the new imaging modality, PSMA or whatever, mm -hmm. let's say PSMA. And we have absolutely no idea how to deal with this. Mm. The predefined low volume might be, in fact, very often a high volume based on number of METs. Do we treat this guy as a low volume or high volume? We consider volume. The M0, the previously M0, might be very often, in fact, M1. Do we treat this guy as an M0? that is a local disease plus a systemic one, mm -hmm. or as an M1 disease, which is systemic only, with no local treatment. So we clearly opened a huge panel box just based on imaging. We thought it was easy. It's absolutely a nightmare to stratify on that. I think th there's many challenges ahead, oh, aren't yes. there? And I think with new <coughs> imaging techniques coming through, it's going to change a, a, a lot of the ways in which we, we treat people. Um, but generally, Neil, how would you, if you had a choice between Abby and, and, and docetaxel, who do you think the ideal patients are for abiraterone and those for docetaxel? And we've heard, because from Eleni of using biomarkers, which we, we don't have the full data for as yet, um, but, but for, the, for the majority patients coming through the clinic, are there features that would make you recommend one or the other? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the things that we tend to look at is the, the tumor burden and the location of the tumor. Mm -hmm. So I'm also inclined, if someone has visceral metastases, particularly liver, lung, uh, I'm more inclined to start with uh, docetaxel uh, and get the six cycles in, um, as opposed to a patient who might be older with just high volume bone mm -hmm. metastases or uh, y or someone who would just not be fit for, for taxane-based mm -hmm. therapy. One of the challenges regarding uh, selection is assuming that it's a toss-up. Say they're both equally mm -hmm. uh, appropriate uh, therapies. Most patients, when you offer them the choice, they're going to usually shy away from you know, chemotherapy just for the notion of what chemotherapy sure. is in their minds, which is not always necessarily appropriate. I mean, we know patients did extremely well in both the charted and in the stampede trials, the t younger, better performance status. And the thing that's really unknown to us is if they get six cycles, uh, where would the subsequent sequencing of abiraterone come into play? We don't have that data. Uh, my, my feeling is, is that if it were me, uh, I, I think I'd be more inclined to want to take on that successive uh, 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 paradigm, that regimen. Of course, we've got a lot of other trials that are going on right now, Absolutely. looking at combining low and high volume with uh, new therapies, uh, as well as existing ones. Enzalunamide is a, has a trial with, called the ARCHES trial. Uh, the ARISENS trial with darolutamide is low and high volume combining with docetaxel. So it's an exciting time for clinicians to follow this data. 
I, it certainly is, and I think we're going to have even more questions in, in mm -hmm. the future, in, in obviously, in making these decisions. Eleni, what's been your experience of people having avaratorone and, and docetaxel in this hormone-sensitive state? What's their quality of life so been like? I'm going to get to that, but I wanted to add a little something mm. to what Please exactly do. you said, Neil. After reviewing very carefully the data from Stampede, and latitude, both stampede arms that have been reported, one sees that the patients who are randomized on the treatment arm, if you look at subsequent treatments, actually get more of the other active agent as well. Mm. So that is very interesting. And if you look at what was the control arm, invariably, when they progress, they get less of the alternate active drug and less of the original randomized drug. Mm. It's not like later they get it. Mm. So it turns out to be that consistently, with the exception of the charter that I think didn't have that kind of follow-up, that you're seeing that the winner is the arm that got both. Mm. So I'm not really sure that sequence at the end will matter if we get, unless you go to the detail, but it's just to give the opportunity patients to have access to both different mm -hmm. mechanisms of action. So that's what I try, as, as you suggested also, to include in my clinic. So we have, I think what we've learned through this experience is to be very vigilant. Mm -hmm. Not to just say, oh, this is metastatic hormone sensitive. We can get away with not having any imaging whatsoever for three years, which we used to see. Mm -hmm. Because now we have options mm -hmm. and we can act. Mm -hmm even if the patients are not symptomatic. Because we used to be governed by an idea, there may be imaging progression, but there's no symptoms, why treat? I think this culture is changing, and that's mm. the important part. So coming to the part about um, how patients tolerate. tolerate these drugs. Well, the first shock is when you tell a patient, I think you need chemo, because the culture, again, for a hormone-sensitive, newly diagnosed is chemo, mm. me? Mm. And then you explain the breast cancer paradigm, and it becomes yeah. more palatable. Uh, but if you, you need to monitor these men, I think we all mm -hmm. agree. It's not like in hormone sensitive, we've seen some toxicity. The same applies with Aberadol. Mm -hmm. I have had a lot of retraining and retraining to not drop that steroid. Patients think mm -hmm. that because they don't understand, it's not mm -hmm. super physiologic. You need to train them because mm -hmm. you get in trouble. Yeah. So I don't know, Nicola. I fully agree with this. Almost nothing to, to add, except to be provocative with of you. Course. As usual, I fully agree that if you visit meds, I would prefer to go for docetaxel, except the evidence is very weak, almost inexistent for that. We had patients treated with Abby with visual meds, they responded. Visual meds equal poor, poorer prognostic compared to no visual meds. It's by no means strong evidence to suggest that giving chemo first is more effective than giving chemo later, provided they received all the drugs. And that mm -hmm. probably, we all agree on that, probably, mm -hmm. that the key message is give as much resume as possible. So don't waste time using drug A, then drug B, then again drug A. There are at least four drugs in top five nowadays, depending on country, radium is allowed or not allowed. And you must receive all the drugs to have the longest survival. But this law is a poor prognostic, for sure. Is it but mandatory? It was part of latitude, wasn't it? I mean, it was one of the three yeah, entry exactly, criteria yeah. for latitude, yeah. which I think made it quite yeah. surprising because I think chemotherapy, you sort of almost equate this with exactly, yeah. chemotherapy. And I, I take your point completely, but I think the, the choice is there. So perhaps we have if, if too many choices. A question for Neil again. You said, depending senior adults, do you really believe age is a criteria for choosing Abby or docetaxel? Is clearly, is there's clearly a link between age and chemotherapy? So for me personally, no. I think that uh, I don't uh, look to chronologically bias patients. I completely agree with you. It really comes <coughs> down to performance status. Yeah, exactly. And it really comes down to having, and it's a bit of a hackneyed expression, but I think it's actually pretty good that we really do a better job of having that shared discussion yeah, exactly. and letting the patients decide. Of course, and, and, and to your point, you're absolutely right. The latitude data, the patients did remarkably well. Uh, and if you looked at the forest plot mm -hmm. on visceral metastases mm -hmm. as well. So, and maybe a part of it is, you know, just a historical biases that many of us have. 
I think Neil, you've summed it up perfectly there, because it, it does come down to the multidisciplinary team, and I thank my colleagues very much for being a great multidisciplinary <laughs> team this evening. But most importantly, it comes down to a discussion with the patient, and I think that that sometimes gives us very different views to perhaps what we'd have thought initially, but ultimately we're a team, the doctors, the patient, their family, in making the right decision. And I think we're sitting in a very happy place to say that we do have choices at the moment and potentially many more to come. So until we next meet, when I think there will be more trials available for this hormone-sensitive setting, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.